really want to make sure that we all have an understanding of database stuff before we get into the creation of web pages. So we're going to spend a little bit more time on database stuff. We went over um, last week an example of database design and we'll probably go over another one before we're done with this section. But I do want to go in a slightly different direction today and talk about <coughs> SQL uh, or SQL. Um, it is a language used to uh, query databases. It is a language that is used to manipulate databases. In fact, it's a language that is actually used to change the structure of databases. You can create tables in a database using SQL and alter the tables and create indexes and do all kinds of fun things like that. We're not going to focus on that quite so much. Um, there's typically GUI tools that allow you to do that. Uh, there's, a, there's a purpose for it, and it's good to know, but I don't think that's our prime, prime job. So what I want to do is I want to go over uh, some more SQL stuff, uh, or some SQL stuff before we get in. We left off last time with a set of tables that look like this, and I'm going to put them up on the board. And I'm going to use uh, a notation of a single asterisk to indicate primary key and uh, two asterisks to indicate a foreign key. And in most cases, it should be obvious what the foreign keys are between. If not, um, I can clarify that for you. Um, you might have slight differences in this, but in essence, what I'm going to put up there is the correct solution. And again, there's a little bit of wiggle room where you could have done things a little bit different way. In particular, choosing between natural keys and uh, surrogate keys for building, for example. You could make the building code a primary key because there's no two buildings that have the same building code. Or you could make a surrogate key. That really doesn't matter too much. If you do make surrogate keys, remember you ought to make unique indexes on the candidate keys. Well, let me put up here, and then we'll start playing with SQL. So first of all, we have a computer table. Uh, I'm going to try to project it so I don't have to walk back and forth. you see ID, I mean uh, more than likely an auto number key, so it would just start with one and generate down. A building code, which again would be a candidate key, so we should make a unique index of this. And a building name. We have a room table, primary key room ID, 
foreign key over to the computer table. Um, that's going to have a building ID. And a room number. This would be a foreign key over there. This, because it's a candidate key, you make a unique index from it. You'd have an application table. which would contain an application ID, an app code, and an app name. And then finally you'd have a computer application table. which, because it's an intersecting table between the computer and the application table, it would have both a computer ID and an application ID. realize something, it would be better if I created a Word document with this, because I could post that and I could post the SQL examples in that too. So um, I'm going to go and create a Word document that has this. I won't talk through it. So it's a battle of bands going out going on outside starting at 11 so I hope they don't drown me out so our computer table We'll have a computer ID, your purchased, and a room ID. building table I think I was supposed to encourage you to register and vote to today so register and vote
Remember, anytime you have a many-to-many -many relationship, you're going to end up with an intersecting table that matches up the two tables involved in the many-to-many -many relationship. Typically, it is going to contain the keys of both of those tables as a primary key, as a combination key. <coughs> um, it could have its own generated key, too. All right. Uh, it could have other attributes, if they were attributes that applied to the combination of those two keys. What do I mean by that? I mean that we should not have the application name in this table. Why? Because the application name only depends on the application ID. It doesn't depend on what computer is installed on. So you have a certain application. It's called Word on every computer that it's installed on. It's not called Word and something else on a different computer. However, if I had like a date installed, all right, that would be an example of an attribute that is truly an attribute for the combination of those two things. In other words, yeah, on this computer, on this date, there's a specific date that it was installed, and that could be different for every computer. So if we wanted to have date installed, this would be the place that would put it. Because not every computer gets all their applications on the same day. And the flip side is true, too. Not every application is installed on all the computers on the same day. So it truly is a, an attribute of the computer application combination. All right. We're going to write some queries here. Now, as I mentioned, the, the, the database statements to create, modify tables, and so on, we're not going to really spend time on that. We are going to spend time on insert, updates, and deletes. Okay, uh, but we're probably going to spend most time on queries. All right, if you remember going way back to when we started talking about databases, one of the power, one of the one of the the chief powers, the chief benefits of using relational databases, is that they allow queries in a variety of ways. All right, if you have an Excel spreadsheet, which is kind of like what a flat file is. It's kind of hard to present it more than one way. All right, so if you have a spreadsheet that's organized in a certain way, it's kind of hard to organize it some other way. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's kind of hard. Compare that with relational databases and the power of SQL, you can take the same data and report it many different ways. Let's start with about the simplest query I can think of. Give me a list of all the computers on campus. And for all computers, I want to see their computer ID, the year purchased, and room ID. So how do I get a list of com the computer ID, the year purchased, and the room ID for all computers? Okay. No, you're, you're on the right track. It is a select statement. Okay, so queries in SQL start with the word select. So, we have the word select. Then we have a list of columns that we want. So we say select columns, whatever those columns are. I'm going to put the keywords in capitals and in lowercase I'm going to put like where there'll be a list of things. No, we don't put the word columns. We actually list the columns. All right. From table.
where Here's sort of a simple version of a select statement, and we can get we can get more in depth with this, and we will. But this is sort of a template for most of the SQL statements, or many of the SQL statements that we're going to see, we're going to encounter. So if I want to see a list of all the computers, and I want to see for each computer the computer ID, the year purchase, and the room ID. All right. I would say select star, let me keep with that, and never mind. Select star from computer. When you say star, you're saying all the columns. So select star from computer says give me all the columns. That would be the equivalent of saying select computer ID your purchased room ID from computer. Now we're not linking any of the related tables yet. Uh, you had started to get into what if we wanted to pull stuff from the other tables and we're not there yet. This was just a simply a one table select. Alright? And it looks like that. So those two would be equivalent. Okay? If we do that, what order are the computers going to be in? If I say select star from computer, what order are we going to get them in? The order that they're entered? Any other thoughts? Okay. Did you say descending or ascending? Descending. For on the computer ID? All right. Actually, this is a little bit of a trick question. The answer is, is you really honestly don't know. All right. Relational databases, now many databases will give you either in the order centered or in the order by key. But there's no guarantee that you will always get that. All right? And therefore, if you want it in a certain order, you need to put an order by clause on it. Okay? So if I want this sorted by computer ID from the lowest to highest computer ID, I would say order by computer ID. And by default, that's going to be ascending. If I wanted a descending, I would say DESC. If I wanted it sorted by year, I would say order by year purchased. Then maybe within the year purchase, I want to sort by computer ID. and so on. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to say is pay attention to the order by. Pretty much any query that you have, you should include an order by. Because you probably want it in a specific order. And don't assume that it's going to be in a certain order. All right, if you want it in a certain order, include an order by clause. What if I only wanted what if I only wanted computers that were purchased in 2019? How could we get that? 
that's the where clause. So the where clause looks like this. I'm going to get rid of the order by clause temporarily. And I'm going to say where you're purchased equals 2019. Okay? What if I wanted everything purchased before this year? Well, there'll be year purchased less than 2019. What if I wanted computers that were purchased in the future? Just kidding. But maybe it's not good for 2019, but maybe everything purchased after 2017. And we can say greater than or equal to. could say not equal to. All right, anything like that. <clears throat> what if I wanted computers that were purchased either in 2014, 2016, and 2018. I wanted a list of all computers that were purchased in 2014, 2016, and 2018. Why would I want that? I don't know, right? But remember, that's the power of relational databases, is they make these ad hoc, one-time queries that you wouldn't necessarily anticipate it makes those queries easy to do. So if I wanted computers purchased in 2014, 2016, or 2018, what could I do? One way you could do is you could say or. So I could say your purchase equals 2014. What's next? Or, exactly, your purchased equals 2016, or your purchased equals 2018. Okay, why is it an and and not an or? if any of those conditions are true, then it's a computer that you want to include. I'm going to start, if, if I get on the table and stage dive, will the front row promise to catch me? <laughs> yeah, you guys are, yeah, sure we will, yeah. <laughs> You know, and then like, well, we'll just remember that the tapes are rolling, so we'll, we'll get a good video for YouTube. What would happen if I did this? It would have to be purchased, they'd have to have a computer that was purchased in all of those years. So how many computers would we return? Zero. All right. So if we want a computer, whether it was purchased in any of these years, it would be an or here. With an or, remember, only one of the conditions needs to be true. With an and, they all need to be true. And so if I say a computer purchased in 2014 and 2016 and 2018, no computer is purchased in all those years. It gets real tricky when you start throwing knots in there. All right? For example, what if I wanted to exclude computers that were purchased in these? Would this work? I want to exclude computers that were purchased in 2014, 2016, or 2018. Would that work? 
it kind of on the surface makes sense that, well, yeah, if you want it equal, you'd put equal. If you want it not equal, you'd make it not equal. But let's think about this a little bit harder. Every computer wasn't purchased in one of those years, so this would choose every computer. Does that make sense to you? Why every computer would be selected if that's a where clause? Because pick a year, 2017. Is the year purchased not 2014? Yeah. 2018. Is the year purchased not 2014? Yeah. And because it's an or, only one of those conditions need to be true. So if I want to do a not here, you'd actually have to have an and here. A little counterintuitive maybe, but that's why it helps to understand instead of like memorizing that. You use or between conditions. Well, it depends on the condition. All right? If you throw nots in there, you're probably going to have ands and not ors. Because no matter what, a computer is not having one of the years. Yes? Are you, are you doing well? um, in the case where you, where you have like you purchase sequels to or routine or you purchase sequels to 16, et cetera, you just wrap back them in parentheses and then put a not operating in front of that. Would that work? Almost. All right, we're going to get to that in a second. So, let's go back to the original one. An alternate way to do it is this. So if I wanted a computer that was purchased in one of these three years, I could say select those fields from the computer table where the year purchased is in this list. All right? This is good to know because especially if you had a long list, all right, this makes the code more readable and less prone to error. And then to your point, if I wanted to do not, then I would say you're purchased not in. Like that. Okay. The kind of select statements we're looking at now will give us one row in the result for every row selected. So we're seeing individual computers here. We're seeing a line for every individual computer that meets the criteria of the WHERE clause. If there's no WHERE clause, how many computers do we get? All of them. All right? There's no where clause, so we use a where clause to filter things down. With no where clause, like we have up here, we're getting all of the computers. If we have a where clause, that's going to filter things down. But we're still seeing one line for each computer, all right? Each computer is selected. What if we want to see not number of, not, 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 e not a line for each computer, but we just want to see totals, all right? What if we want to see how many computers we have? Well, one thing that we could do is we could do this, 
and sit there and count. Gee, I hope that's not the answer, right? Because that's a lot of work, right? How could we get a total of the number of computers that we have on campus? So what would the statement look like? All right. Select. What do I type next? Okay. You're missing one thing. Not after the asterisk, but around the asterisk. So select count from computer. All right. So that would give you the count of the total number of computers. This would give you simply one number. It would not give you a line for each computer. It would just give you 478, or however many computers there were in the database. All right. Count is known as an aggregate function, all right? An aggregate function is where you apply a function on a group of records, all right? In this case, we said, give me a list of all the computers and tell me how many there are. Apply the count function. Let's add another column to the computer table. Let's add price. All right. I could get, I could do this, sum of price. The asterisk, by the way, simply means a number of rows. All right. If you're going to use the sum, or the average the minimum or the maximum you have to put the field that you want the minimum or maximum or average or sum for so select count, star, sum price, average price, min price, maximum price from computer would give us one row. That one row would contain the total number of computers, the total of all the prices of the computers, the average of all the prices of the computers, the minimum price, and the maximum price. All right. Can we put a WHERE clause on this? Absolutely. All right. I can say WHERE your purchased equals 2019. And that would give me that one line but included in the totals would only be the computers purchased in 2019. Okay. Likewise, if I said, give me year purchase greater than 2017, that would include anything purchased in 2018, 2019, and it would give me those totals for that. Can I put an order by in this? Not really. All right? Because there's only one row that's going to be returned. So I guess you could put an order by. It probably wouldn't blow up, but it really wouldn't matter. Question? Okay. What if I wanted to tell how many computers I had for each year purchased. 
So I want to see something like this. 2016, I have 50 computers. 2017, I have 121 computers. 2018, I have 344 computers. And 2019, I have 212 computers. Let's say I want my output to be that. What would my select statement look like? Yes. No. Count distinct for year would tell me that there were four years. We are going to do a count, but we have to change it. So let's let's start out with this. Select count star from computers. What did we say that that will give us? <coughs> How many computers we are, but just one total. All right, not broken down by year, but just one total. So that would give us whatever the sum of those numbers are. Okay, so we want the year included too. So I'm going to do this. This is not correct. All right. But this is moving towards being correct. What would happen if we did that? This is where I really wish, like, that last band would just start playing, like, really loud. Because it would blow up. All right? It would blow up why? Let's think of this logically. If I say we have 518 computers, what year are they purchased? Well, there isn't a single year that they were purchased. They were purchased across many years. So I can't say, give me the count of the total number of computers along with the year that they were purchased. Because different computers have a different year that they were purchased. So that's why this statement is going to blow up. Because count is a total, and your purchased is for each individual computer. So we have to add something to this. It's not a where by clause, it's not a where clause, and it's not an order by clause. It's another clause. A group by clause. And that will do the trick. Because what the group by clause says is it says give me not just one total, but give me a total, subtotal, give me totals broken down by year entered. So in other words, instead of giving me just one total, it's going to give me the total for 2016. Now all the computers in 2016 have the year entered of 2016. So I can say, if I'm breaking it down by group entered, what is the year purchased for that group? All right. Well, the year purchased for that group, I put year entered there. Should be year purchased. The year purchased for that group is 2016. The next group of things, what is the year purchased for that group? It's 2017. What is the per, uh, year purchase for the next group? 2018, and so on down the line. So, here's a rule. And it's, it's good if you understand why this rule is true. But it's also good if, even if you don't remember why this rule is true, and you just remember the rule. All right? When I have an aggregate function, in a SQL statement. 
I have an aggregate function and a SQL statement. Everything that's not an aggregate function has to be included in the group by. So in this case, I say select year purchased, comma, count from computer. Group by year purchased. What is not an aggregate function? Your purchase is not an aggregate function. Is it in the group by? Yes, it is. You're okay. If, however, I said something like this, give me the year purchased and count from computer, but group it by the room ID, that wouldn't work because room ID if I have the totals broken down by room ID, what's the year of purchase for all the computers in this room? There is no year purchase for all the computers in this room. All right. Now, what if I did this? Could I do that? The, well, could I do it and should I do it? It's two different questions. I could do it. This would not give me an error. But what's wrong with this? Yes? It'll only show the Yeah. It would show me the numbers. It would show me 50, 121, 344, 212. But it wouldn't tell me what year they were purchased. So really wouldn't do me any good. All right. So, a rule to live by is when you use a group, when you use aggregate functions, the things that aren't aggregate functions and the things in the group by clause ought to match. Because one way will give you an error. If it's in the list of columns but not in the group by, you'll get an error. The other way gives you meaningless results. It'll give you your totals, but it won't tell you where those totals are from. Now, I could apply many aggregate functions here, too. So I could say, you give me a count, star, and average price. And it would break it down and so on. Okay? Questions about this? There's one more thing. Do I have any money? Does Nora give out money for questions that you get right? I've heard rumors of that. Or maybe it's like coupons or something. Pardon me? It was like, you need $5 one time. Wow. Oh, okay. Oh, yours was a bookstore? Yeah. Oh, he actually gave everyone $5 a month. Wow. <laughs> wow. W suggestion, take him instead of me. Because I, <laughs> let's see, I have a dollar. <laughs> I'm almost willing to say, though, what if I did want to see every year? What if I only wanted to see years in which there were less than 50 computers, less than 100 computers purchased. A where clause is a great thought. And we'll talk about using a where clause in a minute here. But the problem with the where clause is where clauses work on individual rows. They don't work on aggregate functions. So, I couldn't say where count is less than 50 because count's an aggregate function and you can't include an aggregate function in a where clause. It's actually the having clause. Have 
having clauses work on aggregate functions. So I could say having a count of less than 100. Now, can I use a WHERE clause with an aggregate function? Yes. But the WHERE clause will filter out rows before they are aggravated, I almost said, aggregated. I don't know, maybe before they're aggravated too. <laughs> but I would say uh, where year purchased is greater than 2017. What that would do is that would only give me these two rows. All right, because it would filter out everything that was before, that was 2017 or before. It wouldn't include them. And then it would take the aggregate function only for those things that were after 2017, so 2018 and 2019. The thing to remember about this is where clauses filter out individual rows before they get aggregated. And having clauses filter out groups of rows and use the aggregate function. All right, here's another good one. I, I love SQL. I, I'm, I'm so annoyed that my schedule prohibits me from teaching CISS 143 because I love database stuff, all right? And, but I just, you know, I, I, I can't teach the classes I currently do, let alone adding an extra one on there. How could I tell if I wanted a SQL statement? All right, let's, let's think of this. And it's a little bit of a trick because I want you to sort of go through the thought process, but we haven't really talked about how to do this yet. So don't feel bad if you can't figure it out, is I guess what I'm trying to tell you. I want to find out what the most expensive computer on campus is. All right? So, how could we find out the cost of the most expensive computer on campus? Yep, we would say select max price from computer. What would that give us? That would give us the price of the most expensive computer. So, I don't know, $3,200 let's say. That told us the price, it didn't tell us what the computer is. So how can we come up with which computer is the most expensive computer? direction. The problem with that is when you group by computer ID, it's going to give you one line for each computer ID. So it's going to put one computer on a line. And the max price of a computer that has that computer ID is that computer. So it simply would give you a list of computer IDs and their prices. All right, let's, let's build this. All right, let, let's think through this. I run this query, and I, could we do this in two queries? Let's put it this way. Could I do it in two queries? I think we can. So, <coughs> my first query I run, and I say select max price from computer. I get $3,200. Now, what do I want to see? 
I want to see which computer has a price of $3,200, right? So how could I get which computer has a list has a price of $3,200? Well, we're going to come to a nested one, but and we're going to build to that. If I know that the price is $3,200, I could say select star from computer where price is equal to 3200 all right now give me the computer or computers that have a price of $3,200 now the only problem if this was a, a query that we ran every month let's say would have to run two queries to get our result right because $3,200 might be the most expensive computer at this moment in time but it wouldn't necessarily be the most expensive computer a month from now. So, what do we do? We the nest what? It's a nested from. So you like you select all from and then that top query and then I believe it's from computer. You're close. Yes. Sort of. You guys, if you put your heads together, I think you'd have the right answer. You can replace this $3,200 with, how did I know what the most expensive was? I ran this query. So I can nest the queries like this. So just like other things in the mathematical world, blah, 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 things go from innermost to outermost. So first, that query would be run to give me the maximum amount for it. And then the value of that query would be plugged into the where clause of the bigger query to give me the list of computers that have that. <clears throat> do I expect you to like have all these memorized? Of course I do, right? And all these other things that we haven't even talked about yet, you need to memorize. No, of course I don't expect you to have them memorized. But I do want you to understand capabilities. I want to plant that idea in your head. This is how I can group things together to get totals instead of every single row. This is how, I, you know, this is how I can limit what groups get outputted, not based on individual rows, but based on the result of an aggregated, aggregated query. What if I want to use an aggregated query in another query. How can I do that? How I can estimate? I want you to get a sense of the different capabilities so that when you're working on something and you see a problem and you see a query that you need to run, that you have some tools in your tool belt. And you might not know exactly how to do it, but you know that, hey, I remember that you could do this. I wonder if that would help. Or I remember that you can do this. The great thing about SQL is really it's a very simple language, especially for SQL queries, all right, but it's very powerful in the sense that the way that you can combine things so flexibly allows you to get out pretty much anything that you want, all right, and that's really where the power of SQL comes from. And what does that mean for an organization? You can combine the raw data <clears throat> in a bunch of different ways. All right? So, maybe we're not interested in seeing every branch in our company. We just want to see the branches that have less than average sales. All right? I'm going to create a real simple table here. Let's say I have a table that is branches. And there's a branch ID. City. And 2018 and, and yearly sales.
All right. <clears throat> I could look and say, okay. <clears throat> select star from branches order by yearly sales. And I could make that ascending. So the lowest yearly sales would be on top. The second lowest would be on uh, second and so on down the line. But I still have my 300 branches. All right. I could do descending if I wanted to. And I could see them going from the highest sales to the lowest sales. What if I wanted to see the branches that had less than average sales? All right. I wanted to see branches that had less than average sales. All right. How could I do that? Exactly. Exactly. Select star from branches. Where yearly sales are less than, again, if I knew that number off the top of my head, I'd just put it in, right? But I don't know that number, and that number could fluctuate. Where yearly sales is less than, select average yearly sales from branches. <coughs> what if I wanted to see sales that were less than 70%? of the average, the real horrible branches. I could just say this. Could get the aggregate function of the average sales, take 70% of it, give me everything whose yearly sales are less than 70% of that. So I remember, I remember back in the old days, all right, this is literally the case. We would print, I worked for a car rental company, and we would, and, and at the time we did not have a relational database. We had files. We had a file system. I don't know if that was the reason that we had this issue or not, but we would print these reports, and we did literally have like 300 some branches nationwide, and we had 15,000-ish cards that were, that were out on the road. So, you know, a lot of data. We would go and we'd print out these giant printouts, like this thick. We'd go and we'd plop them on the desk of a manager, and the manager would literally flip to the last thing, yep, okay, boom, all right, and pull the number that they wanted. How inefficient is that? All that time and processing, not to mention paper, to go and to print something when all they're interested in is certain things, you know. Why show a list of, of every branch and every sales when the manager maybe that manages that is only interested in the poorly performing branches, the ones whose sales is less than a certain amount compared to the average of the company. By carefully crafting these queries, you could pinpoint and give the people in your organization the precise data that they need instead of giving them reams of data that they have to flip through and hopefully find the, the stuff that they're looking for. All right? That's why we go all over all these different methods so that you can really write your queries in such a way that really pinpoint the information 
that someone can take and do something with. All right. Um, next time, I, I, I was going to start it, but we'll, we'll have a, we'll have a, a brief, uh, we'll have a slightly shorter class today. Um, next time we'll go over what if there's multiple tables involved in queries and maybe we'll have another database design example.